And we're on. Okay. On behalf of Trenton, on, uh, on behalf of the Trenton Board of Education, I welcome you to TBOE TV radio broadcast on Trenton Talks. Thank you to our sponsors, WIMG 1300 AM and WPH Wise Verizon Channel 28. My name is Gerald Truart. I'm your host. I serve as a board member of the Trenton Board of Education. I'm chairperson of the Family and Community Engagement School Support Committee. I serve along with board committee members, board president Addie Daniels Lane, and board committee members Denise Johnson and Yolanda Moreto Lopez. I'm also serving as chairperson of the Ford, po Ford Policy Committee and as a member of the Human Resources and Facilities, Buildings and Grounds Committee. I'd like to thank Mr. James Earl, our superintendent, for his leadership, his support, and his commitment to our school community. I introduce our leaders on the call today. Uh, Assistant Superintendent of School Support, Rafael Ortiz, our uh, Micah Freeman, our, our Supervisor of School Nursing, and Keisha Jackson, our uh, grants, uh, grants Coordinator, Director of Grants, I believe, or Grants Coordinator. And also, of course, our co-host, our co-host, Denise Kreese, our Parent Community Liaison and Homeless Liaison Coordinator of Parent and Homeless Liaison for Trenton Public Schools. I want to thank all of our attendees via Zoom Live and our guests via Trenton Public Schools Facebook Live page. I'd like to also thank, thank again our sponsors, WIMG 1300 AM and WPHY Verizon Channel 28. The Trenton Board of Ed TV radio broadcast is on Trenton Talks. It rebroadcasts on radio channel 1300am.com on WIMG on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. TV channel WPHY Verizon Channel 28 on Thursdays at 11 p.m. Our YouTube channel Trenton TV and our Facebook channel Trenton Public Schools. We have an exciting opportunity today of broadcasting this evening a conversation around our elementary and secondary school emergency relief phase three funding called ESRA three with our superintendent James Earl and his leadership team. God bless each and every one of you. Uh, Mr. Earl, can you share with us uh, ESRA three? And so we can start our conversation on ESRA three. Uh, but first, let me just ask our board president for opening comments and we'll go right to you, Mr. Mr. Earl. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm certainly very um, happy to be able to um, join in this particular conversation. Uh, we know that the, uh, the federal government um, certainly is vested in assisting um, our schools to, uh, shall we say, recover uh, from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And these funds, I believe, are designed to help us to be able to do that. So I'm very, very interested in the conversation. And of course, hearing what others have to say in terms of how to use these funds. So again, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me um, to join this conversation this evening. Mr. Arrow. Thank you, President Lane. And thank you, Mr. Trueheart. Um, thank you, team, for joining us. Uh, this afternoon, uh, just want to take an opportunity to share um, information about uh, the ESSER three grant, the uh, ARP. I'm sorry about the um, rearrangement of acronyms. They send you a ton of acronyms. So it's the American Rescue Plan, um, uh, ESSER three grant. Uh, this is a stakeholders meeting. Uh, as a component of the grant, um, we're required to get input from stakeholders in the district. So this is one in a series of opportunities for the community to share. We'll be meeting with district stakeholders, community stakeholders tomorrow. Uh, we'll have meetings on proposals. This is to share information and get input. Uh, the input is written in grant form. So we take all of the ideas and we determine here are the big ideas uh, so that every proposal can fit in the areas um, of need. Today, what we will do is take you through the grant proposal, the grant, uh, the uh, uh, allowable uses for the grant, uh, funding amounts, what we've already determined are critical needs in district, uh, funding remaining, and some of the conversations we're having, uh, and give you some samples of uh, proposals and uh, information, give you some links, uh, places where you can get information, plus share information, because we do want to hear your input. Uh, this, the, the, these funds from the federal government represent all of us. Uh, and so while we are talking uh, across curricular areas and talking with stakeholders in district, 
uh, regarding needs, we certainly want to hear from community members because there may be opportunities there. What we do is at that time, we collect information, we submit the grant. The deadline is November 24th um, for the grant to be submitted. We will submit it on time, but we may continue once we know the big uh, targets around um, how we will use the, uh, the, the uh, grant, grant funds. Uh, we will continue to meet and uh, may, uh, hear ideas about um, uh, solutions and things that we may want to do, proposals, that is. So I'm reading and talking at the same time. So um, so just want to take you through the presentation. Uh, I have Ms. Keisha Jackson, who's joined me. She's our district grants manager. And will probably fill in the blanks or maybe even help me with the presentation uh, this is a critical area for her. She makes sure that we are um, in alignment with how we spend grant funding, making sure that we submit the grant on time. Uh, so she will join me in presentation. Quite often, I will refer just to see if I missed anything. There's a lot of information here. We're going to post this. It's already posted on the website. So what you don't get today, you don't need to take a screen share. This is not hidden information. We actually want to share it. So. Uh, you're going to get links in this uh, and then a location that you can go to the website uh, and get more information. So uh, let's proceed. So for Trenton Public Schools, um, see the elementary and secondary schools emergency relief. That's what ESSER stands for. So when you hear us make reference to ESSER, it's just the acronym. But this is, this is what it's for. It's uh, American Rescue Plan, ARP. ARP just means American Rescue Plan. And here on this page, you can see how, you know, how we're, at, at, how we're allocated. Um, so uh, the first uh, graph shows the total allocation, $44,341,000. Uh, I mean, $44,341,000. Um, and then uh, we made some decisions early on in June Prior to my arrival, I worked, you know, I was in meetings with board me members and the previous administration. And, and we know that the priority, uh, a major priority was facilities, uh, returning to buildings, making sure we had good air filtration, air conditioning where we could add it, window units replaced where we could in time if we could get the supplies in time. Uh, and in our discussion, we talked to buildings and ground staff and I'm sorry, am I sharing this screen? Let me I wanted to say, Mr. Thank you, the co-host. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. you I, share I it. thought I was already sharing. Okay. Right, yeah, we now now All right. back. Yes. <laughs> so back, back to what I said, thank you, thank you. Somebody's supposed to stop me and keep me on task. I uh, was too. <laughs> that was new. Elementary and secondary schools emergency relief. Uh, as I said, the, ESSER is, that's what the acronym for ESSER, uh, as I mentioned, $44,001,341 was our total grant allocation for ESSER. Uh, and then facilities, we determined to have our buildings ready and safe for return. And even thinking about future buildings opening, 29 million was a number that we received from our engineer in terms of how do we get our buildings up to code ready and safe for return. Uh, so we determined that that was the first allocation and the most important thing. We had heard that from staff, many of our community members that, you know, in order to return and have a safe place for students and staff to be in the building, we needed to make sure facilities were ready. And then uh, we, had four, we had 14 million uh, remaining for learning loss and other things. You'll see later that how that allocation is split up, but that's what we're really discussing. So the ideas that come forward really goes toward addressing learning loss and potentially anything that's COVID relief related. Um, there are four other uh, buckets of funding. Uh, you can see at the bottom, these are above and beyond the 44 million. Uh, what you see at the top, accelerated learning, coaching and educator support grant for 1.6 million or more evidence-based summer learning and enriched uh, activities grant. Those are certainly funding that we'll use for the summer and after school. 
uh, and before school or during school, depending. It, it, it's enrichment. So uh, there may be opportunities during school. Evidence-based comprehensive beyond the school day activities. That's, we already know what that is and not always tutoring, but are there uh, social and emotional learning opportunities? And then mental health, um, uh, a grant for eight, uh, 88,000, I think it is. Um, so those mental health support staffing grant. So there are opportunities even beyond the 14 million that you see remaining. Um, and so we're gonna be discussing those as you're thinking about potential uh, opportunities for staff, students, maybe even the community. Please know that these are the areas that we're working with, really the one addressing learning loss and then the four buckets, buckets on the bottom. So uh, here you can see the district must reserve no less than 20%, which is in the neighborhood, Keisha, correct me if I'm wrong, of uh, $8 million. Uh, That's correct. Uh, to its total ESSER three grant allocation. So we must use at least that amount uh, of the 44 million. So of that 14, it must address learning loss. So they're gonna be tremendous opportunities. We know that students were struggling through the pandemic, during the pandemic, and as they return. And we're seeing some of that in our schools. So these are opportunities here. We have some outstanding proposals from our association leaders and some of our leaders in our on our leadership team, administrative leadership team, for how we will do this over the next three years. Um, and then uh, you can see activities, I, I won't read it word for word, but this gives you an idea of some of the areas that we can use, um, that we can uh, use these funds to address. Uh, Ms. Jackson, do you want to share anything from this slide here? So these, um, th this pot of funding is not too much different from our ESSER II pot of funding. It still has those um, allowable expenditures. Um, and with inside our grant application, if we're touching on one of these allowable usage, um, we will be able to put the activity in our grant. Yeah, Keisha, could you, for our radio listeners, could you just go through those very briefly? Um, if you don't mind, Superintendent, just go okay. briefly for our radio listeners. Okay, so um, our one of our, our allowable uses is the same as all of our title and federal funds and our ESSA grant. ESSA one, two, three, our um, Perkins grant. We, we are able to blend those funds or use those funds to help with any title one um, through Title IV, as well as Perkins need. We also can collaborate with those funds with any state, local agencies. We don't have any tribal um, agencies we have to collaborate with. And we can provide um, administrators and leaders in the district with professional development. Also, there also the McKinney Rental Homeless Assistance Act, that's also a part of a part of it as well. Right, right. There's also there's 16. If if we advance the slide, I can go through each of those. So briefly. so yeah, this number three is principals providing principals and other school leaders with the resources necessary to address the needs of uh, their individual schools. So principals can determine are there needs that they have related to this grant. Uh, so those are opportunities. Number four is activities to address the unique needs of low income children or students, children with disabilities, English learners, racial and ethnic minorities, students experience home, experiencing homelessness and foster care youth, including how outreach and service delivery will meet the needs of each population. Number five, developing and implementing procedures and systems to improve the preparedness and uh, response efforts of local educational agencies. Number six, training and professional development for staff of the local educational agency on sanitation and minimizing the spread of infectious diseases. Number seven, purchasing supplies to sanitize and clean facilities. So we do that in district already. This is an opportunity to add to that. Number eight, planning for and coordinating during long-term closures. So if we were to have to close, there could be opportunities where we might need meal assistance 
uh, for families, for meal eligible families. All of our families are meal eligible. How to provide technology for online learning. We're one to one in district. This gives an op us an opportunity potentially to um, talk about internet and being able to access those dev devices wirelessly and how to ensure other educational services can continue to be provided consistent with all federal, state, and local requirement. Purchasing educational technology. This is another opportunity where if we want to be one-to-one -one and we want to use those for educational reasons instead of during closures, this is an opportunity to make sure that happens. So an assistive technology for students and adaptive technology for students with disabilities. Number 10 was providing mental health services and supports. Um, number 11 was planning and implementing activities related to summer learning and supplemental after school programs, and including providing classroom instruction or online learning during the summer months and addressing the needs of low-income students, students with disabilities, English learners, migrant students, students experiencing homelessness and children in foster care. So number 12, addressing learning loss among students, including low-income students, the same group, students with disabilities. Uh, and it had subcategories under, under this one, uh, administering and using high-quality assessments that yield valid and reliable to accurate, accurately assess student academic progress, uh, assist educators in meeting student needs, including through different, differentiating instruction. That's the reason why we're talking to educators also. What are their needs? What are they seeing? Are there, are there potential needs uh, for these funds? And no different than ESSER, ESSERS 1 and 2, implementing evidence-based activities to meet the comprehensive needs of students, providing information and assistance to parents and families on how they can effectively support students. So that's a big part about communication. So we're certainly really interested there to make sure we can provide families that information. D was tracking student attendance and improving student engagement in distance education. Uh, 13, um, school facility repairs, which we talked about early that we felt like uh, would take a huge chunk of funding uh, and improvements to enable operation of schools to reduce the risk of virus transmission and exposure to environmental health hazards and to support tests, maintain, repair, replace, and upgrade projects to improve indoor quality. That's where that 29 million, 13 and 14 really addressed the $29 million that we felt like was, was priority spending, um, including mechanical, non-mechanical heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, filtering, purification, other air cleaning fans, control systems, window and door repair and replacement. So when you saw earlier on the big decision to do that, that's what came out of many discussions prior to my arrival, how important it was to make sure we were prepared and safe to return to school for staff and students. 15 is other activities that are necessary to maintain operation of the continuity of services in local education agencies. That's anything that we do. So other, other activities is if we find a need that COVID has presented us, so the pandemic has presented us, we can use funding for that and developing strategies to implement public health protocols, including to the greatest extent practical policies in line with guidance from the CDC for the reopening and operation of school facilities effective, effectively maintain the health and safety of students, educators, and other staff. So those are the 16 allowable spending needs. You can see the range there. So as you listen and as you think about opportunities here, if you're a listener, if you're on the radio uh, and you have ideas, we're gonna give you a platform to be able to share that information. So as we go forward, you'll be able to go to the website. There's a link that takes you to some opportunities to do that. Uh, Ms. Jackson, do you have anything to add to those? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so under those other four buckets um, of areas, here is the information related to that. 
Uh, I talked about accelerated learning, coaching, and education, uh, educator support grant. That was uh, 1.6 million. I think I, I may not remember the numbers correctly, but it'll be in the presentation. This is opportunities to provide evidence-based professional learning and coaching opportunities to a variety of school staff, including educators, key support, counselors, special education personnel, nurses, social workers, psychologists, everyone in our organization. Um, it should be surrounding teaching and learning that fosters, fosters social and emotional well-being of students, families, and educators, improve equitable, equitable access to grade level content, high quality resources for each student, prioritize content and learning by focusing on the depth of instruction rather than the pace, and implement a K-12 accelerated learning cycle to identify gaps. We're already doing some of that work. This helps us to have funding in case we need to go deeper. And I would imagine as the year goes on, and this is a three-year grant process, ESSER grant three uh, ends, we have three years to spend the funding. So by the end of the school year 2024, <laughs> I think is correct. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to think about things that we might do in a year or two years. So we're looking for opportunities to continue the good work that we're already doing. Uh, the accelerated learning and coaching educator support topics uh, I have on the screen here, developing positive school climates, uh, culturally responsive teaching practices, uh, increasing digital literacy, uh, assessments, uh, using data to improve instruction, engaging educators and parents in the community to prioritize standards, Identif identifying the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on different student subgroups, uh, administering high quality assessments so we can accurately assess students, uh, supportive intervention, uh, multi-tiered system of supports, response to intervention, RTI, extending and expanding high quality learning, activities um, and then facilitating other professional learning that will empower educators to meet the needs of their students. So there's so much here that we can do. Uh, the range is vast. Uh, so as you're thinking through and you see something that really sparks your interest, uh, certainly um, share that with us. Evidence-based beyond the second bucket of money was evidence-based beyond the school day and summer learning and enrichment activities grant. Well, we know one-to-one -one tutoring, uh, time for re-socialization and developing social and emotional skills and growth mindsets in students. We know what students have had to do for the last two years, because we as adults have had to do it. And these are opportunities not just for students as we talk about what's good for students. These are certainly great opportunities for staff. We understand we have to develop great growth mindsets for staff. We've all been, uh, uh, exposed to the same type of isolation that COVID creates, uh, an array of acti activities responding to students' academic, social, and emotional and mental health needs, uh, professional learning for educators, education and training program for their parents and caregivers. So as we look at this, there are opportunities there to meaningfully engage uh, parents and families. And so we'll be looking at uh, uh, opportunities there. Mr. Earl, in that, in that first bucket where we talked about um, educators and uh, coaching educator support, that's really focused on providing professional development to our, our teachers and support staff and folks who are putting the boots on the ground in the classrooms and support services to, to students. And that bucket was, I believe, about 1.6 million. Correct. In, in the second bucket, uh, was for summer enrichment, which was right around $112,000 or so uh, for the, those those summer enrichment activities. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then the third bucket, um, I'm not with at the numbers, Mr. The True. The third bucket was also 112, and that was after school programming. So after school in summer was the 112. So you can see here uh, evidence-based practice that can fall under any of the below four tiers of evidence. Strong evidence from at least one well-designed, well-implemented experimental study. Moderate evidence from at least one well-designed and well-implemented quasi-experimental study. 
Tier three, promising evidence from at least one well-designed, well-implemented correlation study with statistical controls for selection bias, and then demonstrates a rationale based on high quality research finding or positive evaluation. That's tier four, that such activity, strategy, or intervention is likely to improve student outcomes or other relevant outcomes. Um, so, and then mental health support staffing grant, that was 88,000, is that correct? 88501. Yes, you're all point, right so, on point, then, Mr. Earl. Supports to implement tier two targeted small group interventions and tier three intensive intervention services in accordance with a multi tier system of supports framework that addresses students and educators' mental health and social and emotional needs through the hiring of staff, contracting a service or providing professional development and effective implementation of tier two and tier three services. So uh, Mr. Earl, so, uh -huh. in that mental health, that's where some of our community agencies could, could get a proposal because it it's for mental health and we can network with them and work with them if they have proposals they wanna submit regarding mental health and how do we support our students who are struggling right now with mental health issues because of the COVID. Yeah. And also staff that may be struggling. And staff as well, yes. Yeah, that's correct, Ms. Ortiz. I have a quick question as well. So when we talk about mental health services, is this something that we're gonna put an RFP out for? Or like how would an organization know to submit a proposal? Or is there another separate communication that will come from Keisha? Uh, Ms. Grant, I mean, Ms. Jackson, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know if you wanted to further explain that process. So typically what we, what, what we are doing, we are asking the community to submit proposals. When we get the proposals, we don't necessarily have to put exactly what vendor or um, will be in our grant. We are just identifying what need we are putting in our grant. And then we'll go on internally and do an RFP or what have you. So who would they send their proposals to, to you? So the proposal is gonna be a direct link on the school district website. As soon as they, they, can, they can access the link, fill out the proposal, and we'll have access in real time of the proposals that are being submitted. Awesome, is that link available now or will that be later down the road available. It, it's okay, available. It's not, available. Okay. Now. I was about to say it's going to be available this morning if it's not right now. <laughs> it's it's, it's actually available. Up. Yeah, it's, awesome. a, it's up right now. Yes. Uh, we what we wanted to do is see if there would be any tweaks to the presentation. However, it's up and available and I'm going to have it on the screen in just a minute. Uh, but you can go to the website. It lives on the main page. Um, you can also reach out to Keisha uh, K. Jackson at trenton.k12. We'll say our email addresses. You can reach out to anyone on this call. We'll get you to the right location, but if you go on the website, you should be able to find it. So uh, it, it should be, go ahead, Mr. Ortiz. No, that was it. I, I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that, that we are available to support any, any community agency or parent out there who needs additional information. And we'll yep. provide that on the chat as well. Um, at this time, I have an additional question, and my question is relative to the fact that this is a, a three-year grant that takes us through um, the year 2024. Um, are there opportunities for revisions as time goes on? Our needs may change based on what we're able to accomplish within a certain time frame. So will there be or is there an opportunity for us to come back and revisit and maybe refocus some of the things that we've said like uh, targeted for a, prior, uh, for a previous year or not included that we found out that we actually needed? There is always an opportunity to revise your grant. Um, the state knows that these are districts that are fluent and things change from you know, year to year, month to month. So yes, there is an opportunity to amend anything that we submit. Thank you. And one of the things that we're gonna to have to do because it's a three-year grant is prioritize, right? 
So we're going to look at what are the most important pieces that we need to prioritize, because it might be that some things get done immediately year one, and certain things may be for year two and, or year three. So that's something that we're going to look at as well. Just thought I'd add that. Mr. Earl. <laughs> Thank you. Just to continue, there, there are some areas under tier two for mental health supports uh, that are on the slides for listeners. Uh, as I said, I go through these quickly, but they will be posted on the website. Certified staff and contract, uh, contracted provider to assess students who show signs of mental health concerns, including trauma, provide valid and reliable assessments tool to assist in identifying students mental health needs, invest in a system to track students in need or of referral or to community-based mental health supports, develop a system district-wide to assist school-based personnel to follow up activities and services, Pro provide stipends to staff to implement monitoring, mentoring programs, group interventions, check-in, check-out systems, or in-school skill building groups, for example, social skills, problem solving skills, goal setting for students with identified needs, provide stipends to certified staff for home visits to follow up on students who are identified through early warning systems, uh, contract with mental health providers, as Mr. Ortiz mentioned earlier, to provide therapeutic services, create partnerships with mental health providers to perform risk assessments uh, in crisis to reduce or eliminate the use of emergency room visits for students. So these are really creative things under tier two. Tier three, there's some similar but more intense type things, contract with mental health providers, with community agencies, some of the same, you know, to provide therapy, create a position or contract with the provider to individually assess students uh, having difficult or behavioral needs, uh, provide staffing consultants to assist with transition of students who may be been placed in out of district settings for tier three interventions as they return to in-person. So a lot of uh, good, good supports through this grant for students and staff who are struggling as a result of the pandemic. And then you just have more of those same things in the next slide. I won't read them all. Uh, well, Mr. Girl, I just wanted to, uh, to emphasize something that, that you had a start in the beginning of the school year. And that is that we, we already started with uh, professional development for, for, for teachers on trauma-informed care. So this grant just allows us to continue to do that work. We, we're not just waiting for the grant under the leadership of our superintendent. We started doing uh, trauma-informed care professional development uh, uh, through the summer and already in September. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, the parents are aware that we are addressing the needs of students right now. This will help us to even do a better job and to bring outside resources to assist us as we provide professional mental health support to uh, our, our students. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. As we, as we segue into um, our, our second half of our broadcast, uh, Wanted to give an opportunity now for just some, a few announcements, if we could, for Mr. Earl, and then we can continue uh, with the presentation. Any announcements uh, from you, Mr. Rafael Ortiz, or from Denise? Uh, Denise will give you a, a, a couple of things that are that we're doing now to address uh, our, our our families. Before uh, you begin, um, Mr. Earl, can you um, close out your share so everyone it could be a, a bigger view? Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Ortiz. No, go ahead. You can go uh, announce yours and then Micah has some announcements that, that are really critical that we think are very important. We want our community to know. Awesome. So tomorrow launches our Parent Connection Series. We are looking forward to meeting parents in person to provide educational services um, for our families. Um, it's a six week series. We have food that will be available, childcare that will be available. Um, we're doing basically a meet and greet tomorrow. We'll do some icebreaker and team building activities. And we also have a parent survey for you guys to complete in order for us to get more information as to how we can improve quality of service here at the school district. So we're really excited for that. I will drop a link. So any parents that wanna sign up, um, I will have that available for all of you. 
Also, the holiday season is coming up and our district is now offering a virtual giving tree uh, for our displaced families that are living in hotels. So we're doing a collection for those families. Um, I've sent out, I will also send that link out into our Facebook um, live page and also within this chat in this group. It's just an awesome time to give. And um, as Winston Churchill once said, we all live to oh my gosh i'm losing it <laughs> but um we all we all uh, make a living right but um in, in order to fulfill that we have to give so i'm sorry that i chopped that all up it's just that my i'm thinking of 10 million things that are going on at once but we're excited to have these opportunities for our families we're excited to be able to start a collection and i know other schools will be doing their own individual collections for families and we're looking also to partner with toys for tots to collect some more toys so more to come on that um, i'll turn it over to micah so that she can share um, her health updates Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, just some really quick updates from the Office of School Health Services that we are every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're doing offering COVID vaccines um, free of charge. We're also offering some school mandated um, vaccines and the nurses, the school nurses have sent out information to our families. So on Monday is at Kilmer Elementary School from four to seven. Tuesday is when it's at Rivera uh, Middle School from four to seven, and then on Wednesday it's at Trenton High School from four to seven p.m. The the COVID vaccines. We want to thank all our parents for, you know, uh, keeping their children home when they're not feeling well. But just a reminder because it's so important that we we don't spread COVID the COVID virus, and we're doing a great job with having minimal minimum spread throughout the district. If your child is, is having a fever, cough, sore throat, headache, please keep them home. Contact your school nurse, contact your teacher, let them know what's going on. Um, we want to make sure, again, that we limit the spread. If someone is sick at home, if, you, if a family member is positive at home, we want to make sure those students stay home because that also will minimize the spread. And our families are doing a great job in doing that, but well, I just want to remind everyone that this is, we're still in a pandemic. Thank, it's very thankful that we're able to stay open. So we want to keep that. And we want to keep our students um, engaged in learning, safely, healthy, and, um, you know, right on time. So thank you. This is, that's all the announcements I have today. Um, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over back to Mr. Earl, and my announcements can come later if necessary. Mr. Earl? Oh, wait, I wanted to um, circle back to Micah because the COVID-19 page is live now and it's available. Did you want to share that? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I want to give a shout out to our communications officer for creating that. We had a um, COVID-19 um, link on our district webpage. It is actually, if you go on our district webpage, it is under staff. It says COVID-19 staff forms. That will, that will take you to um, a bunch of things, right? It will take you to if a staff member is sick and what they need to do. It will take you to um, the different uh, alternatives that staff have to uh, maintain, because as you know, um, all staff must have a COVID vaccine, and if they're not vaccinated, they must be tested. So this is a great opportunity. You can go right on our line. You can get the information. Our district nurses are also on that page. Um, so, so yeah, our website is has a bunch of great information. So we want to make sure that everyone is aware of that. Thanks, Denise. Yep, perfect. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, Superintendent Earl, we need you. Uh, please continue with your presentation. I need to be able to share a screen again. Sure. I think, let's see. Oh, here it is. We'll have access. All right. So back back to the presentation. Just 
Uh, as you think about proposals, uh, we wanted to put it out there, and this will all be on the website also. You see a link on this screen um, at the bottom. Just talk about the elements of a good proposal. This helps us to know the thinking, the cost, who's involved, target population. So you can see the name of the program is going, going to be important. Statement of the need. Why do we need to do this? What's your thinking around the need? Program overview, description of activities, what will take place during this um, event, uh, program detail, the location, target population, schedule, beginning and ending of days, weeks, hours, all of those things are critical. And you can see there's a Google form that you can fill out with the link there. And I'm going to put that link, I hope. Tisha, were you able to find it? I was, but um, Denise has informed me that the, the link is locked, so I'm going to work to make sure it's unlocked for um, okay. all participants to use. You got it. It might. Okay. All right. So uh, if we can, we'll put it in the chat. How, however, it will be on the website so that these are some of the things that uh, we will be requesting if you write a good proposal. I mean, if you just send me an email, I'll read it, but this helps us <laughs> get in the ballpark of the need. Um, let's see, program budget, purchase services cost, if consultants are in, uh, involved, any quotes, resume, letter of agreement, anything that you think is going to help us as we go through that process of approving the proposal. Remember, the grant will already be submitted more than likely. But if you have an interest in a proposal that might um, access these funds, we need to have the information because we'll have competing proposals. We also won't want to see what crosses over. What's similar? Is there something in school being proposed or in district being proposed that's also connected to something in, in the community that we can, you know, get the most bang for the dollars we spend? Uh, so we'll be thinking in those same terms also. And so we did uh, in this presentation, you can't see it, but we provided a sample proposal. Um, we've been working already with, um, as I said, associations. So uh, the Trenton Education Association, uh, the Trenton Administrators Association, the Custodial Association, d and uh, Business and Technical, uh, our Secretaries Association, all of our associations have been thinking through this and we're kind of using this template. So when you get to the website and see the proposal, this gives you a landing spot because we want to make sure that it's comfortable as you complete it. It's also very user friendly for us so that we can see the name, kind of the narrative statement of need, program description. Um, there's cost associated because uh, if we have $14 million and there's 20 million in, in proposals, we have to make decisions. And this helps us. The more information we have, the better. How are we going to impact our community, our students, and our staff through COVID uh, ESSER 3 funds? And that's essentially the presentation. Uh, let me get out of screen. Screen share. And we're back. So. Um, just any questions, as, as I said, this is all live on the website. Uh, we will be presenting again tomorrow to a group in, in person, community group. I'll likely have another session that we have either a community group or another opportunity just to share. These are informational sessions and also opportunities to gather input. Uh, and as I said, Part of the requirement of the grant is that we have informational and input sessions for you to give input. So thank you all for listening. Uh, and any questions that I can answer for the good of the order, I will. Otherwise, so we look forward to seeing you again uh, when we return uh, for another opportunity on uh, TVBOE radio. So encouraging everyone for the community conversation regarding ESSER Esther 3 tomorrow, Wednesday, November 3rd, uh, 4 to 5 in Trenton Board of Education, uh, Ellis Auditorium, that's our administration building, tomorrow, November 3rd, from 4 to 5 on the community and, conversation regarding Esther, Esther 3. And Gerald, just, just yeah. uh, so that 
So th that's by invitation, because of course, with COVID, okay. we have to limit space. <laughs> so, so if you're interested. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so uh, those who, have, yeah, individuals have received invitations or share their interest. Uh, if you're interested, please reach out to Mr. Ortiz, W. Yes. Ortiz at Trenton.K12. Mr. Ortiz, if you can, someone can put his email in there to let him know if you're interested because space is limited. We do have a capacity limit, um, but we'll also certainly, you know, if you call by phone, we can talk to So thank you. Ms. Lane, any questions, Ms. Lane? No, I don't have any questions um, at this time. I'd simply like to say that, you know, I was very happy to hear the rank, the wide range of allowable uses for the um, funds that are being made available, because certainly there are a wide range of needs that are being experienced throughout the community um, in terms of our school community, as well as the community at large that supports our students that actually come to our schools. So I was very happy to hear the wide range of, um, again, uses, uses that are available. And certainly, um, you know, I'm very interested in hearing what the community might have to say in terms of some specific ideas within that realm of how to actually uh, spend the funds. So again, I'm very thankful for the opportunities for community for the community to hear about it, but also to give voice to their uh, ideas and the uh, opportunity to perhaps even present proposals, which I think is a wonderful idea. So again, um, no questions, just a comment in terms of this opportunity is a, is a great one. Hopefully those will uh, individuals will hear about the opportunity and take advantage to share their input. You know, one of the things, Mr. Earl, that, that um is I see throughout throughout the uh, grant proposal is a message around comprehensive needs assessments and many of the uh, DOE uh, Department of Education New Jersey Department of Education presentations talked about uh, needs assessments and comprehensive needs assessments around the use of of the funds and how we actually go about determining uh, what pockets of, uh, of of needs in terms of, of our students that we have. But can you could you share um, about how we're going about um, our needs assessment, our conference needs assessment within the district. You're, you're muted, Mr. Earl. Sorry. The, the most critical thing is collecting data and that data can be around, you know, a number of things. We have ac academic achievement data. We have start strong data that gives us a, a, the first view. Now, whether you agree with testing uh, students early, we all don't like the idea of that but it gives us information to tell us where our students are right now. So that data is a way, that's an assessment. And then now we can use other areas. We can, you know, we're gonna use uh, data for how students are uh, uh, handling returning, socialization, discipline data, what's taking place in our buildings. We already are seeing some of the things happening around the city. And so we know that some of that comes into our schools so what does that mean? So using data to really make assessments is probably the most critical part of a set using these funds. We can't just walk in and say, hey, by the way, we need an after school program. So th that's why the proposal says, tell us why you need it. And mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing, but basically write a description, what's it needed for? And in that, uh, you can see that there's been a description typically of what the need is. There's been some level of research. Uh, so we're going to be asking people for the need. So you might give us a provider pro pro proposal, but we're going to ask you what the need is for. So uh, a lot of good, good information, but using data to make assessments, what it, wherever that data comes from, we know that we have challenges as it pertains to ac uh, academic achievement. We know uh, we're starting to identify the target areas. We know K-3 is really important, but really every grade is. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we, and we know social and emotional uh, support for students is critical every day. And so how do we use the funds to be able to capture those? And you don't need deep data to determine that. We just know that our children arrive with us to, to us uh, coming from their homes, ready to learn, and there may be challenges. So we need to meet that challenge. 
uh, Mr. Earl, uh, just wanted to uh, share that our chief academic officer is, is doing daily walkthroughs in, in our buildings. And so our assistant superintendents of elementary and secondary, I've been looking at special ed and bilingual classrooms. So we're doing walkthroughs, actually visiting classrooms to see what's happening in the classrooms yep. so that we can support teachers, so we can do professional development based on what we've seen. So we got firsthand knowledge by doing some walkthroughs. The one piece that I wanted to share with you is that uh, because it's safe to say, Mr. Earl, that all our buildings will be air conditioned, right? This is part of what we want to do. Oh, and yeah. so, you know, that in the summer, it gets awfully hot. We lose a lot of instructional time in, in the month of June because it gets very warm in our buildings. And oftentimes we have to close schools by one o'clock because we want to want to make sure that everyone is safe. With the buildings being air conditioning and with the systems that we're putting in, the purifiers to make everybody safe and healthy, we're, in, we're gonna increase the amount of instructional time and hopefully that too will support us with learning loss. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. And also maybe this question, Mr. Earl, or maybe for maybe for Keisha Jackson, then I'll, I'll defer to uh, to Denise Kreese if she has any, any questions after after this question. Um, regarding the 40, the 40 initial 44 million and, and the 29.3 million that we use for for facilities, you mentioned that there was about $14.6 million uh, remaining uh, that needed to be allocated uh, um, into various uh, needs in our district. Is that is that the case? That's correct. And of that 14 million, 20%. So if you think 20% of the total grant must be used for learning loss. So, so when you look at the 14 million that's left, remember we use 29 plus million for facilities. So of that 14 million, 8 million must address learning loss. So that leaves roughly $6 million that can address the other needs, the other 16 areas, uh, or within the other needs within that 16 areas. So some of those are academic, but so if that makes sense. So yeah, there's $14 million. So proposals that come in and we are already getting some, because as I said, we, we're already having these meetings, stakeholder meetings include everyone. <laughs> so, so we can't get everyone in a big room and you know, hash it out. So we're doing just slow opportunities in person as much as we can, virtual in other cases. So you're going to be you're having a ser series of in person and, and virtual meetings yep. uh, with mm -hmm. community stakeholders to share the information with them uh, to give them an opportunity to learn about the ESSER funding, um, pockets of money, and pockets of needs in terms of what the requirements are and the right. categories of categories where the money can be appropriated. Um, so they can then submit proposals um, for to the district yes. uh, for needed services that, that we have. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Denise Creek, well, question? Yes, Mr. Earl, yes. I was just going to say, and the key is that, you know, these are COVID relief funds. So yes. as you make your proposal, I might have to say to you, well, this is not a result of, you know, COVID or the pandemic. So it, you need to be thinking how the pandemic impacted what your proposal is representing as you present it, because we will have to answer that question. Uh, there's no way around it with federal funds. You have to be able to communicate that. <laughs> it has to be clear. So <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. So when is the deadline for proposals for those that are joining late? Um, there will be a link that's posted later on. Um, for community organizations to submit proposals, or if you have any questions in regards to submitting a proposal, um, I will leave Ms. Jackson's email if that's okay. Um, so what, it, what's the deadline for this? So the, the deadline for submitting the grant is November 24th. The reason why we're asking for input is that's going to help us write the grant and include all of the allowable uses that are identified. So if for some reason we missed one, uh, we would probably have to amend as uh, President Lane asked before. There's, there's, no, there's no real deadline. We're trying to gather information to write a grant. We can still meet in December. Remember, this is a three-year process. 
We may have funding that we decide we are not going to move forward with, and we decide early next year to meet again because we have another two million. So this is an ongoing process. This is our way to submit our grant, get the our best effort uh, at identifying the allowable uses by November 24th. Uh, but this process of proposals could go on. Uh, someone may come up with an idea and we may not have meetings moving forward, but the opportunity is there for you to reach out and say, hey, thought of this and it's COVID related, can we talk? Yes. Yeah, so I'm really excited for the mental health piece because it's much needed because so many people are struggling silently. So it's really great that it includes staff members as well to be in this lump of receiving um, mental health services. So I'm really interested to see what that would look like and how, you know, staff can take advantage of those opportunities because you know we all have to take care of ourselves in order to take care of our children so i'm really excited for that thank you thank you well one of the things we always say is we you know we solicit public support we solicit everyone's support but i i laughed with our staff yesterday and i said well you know i actually have a ton of ideas <laughs> that probably takes up all the money <laughs> so so i want to be careful and make sure we're listening to everyone uh, and we will do that. So I, I will not be submitting a proposal until I hear from everyone. Uh, <laughs> but our, our hope is that we uh, can, likely we're all in the same place about needs. We, we, we know, you know, we know where our children are. We're starting to learn some of the uh, challenges for staff. Uh, so how do we think about that and be proactive and forward thinking? What does this look like in two years? if we're still using funding or if we still have funding. So it's just great opportunity. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Earl, uh, Denise Treese, uh, Keisha Jackson, Michael Freeman, and Assistant Superintendent Wilfredo Ortiz for school support. Uh, closing comments from our board president, Abby Daniels Lane. Okay, just a quick question before closing comments. And I guess this is for uh, Mrs. Uh, Freeman. Um, I know that the um, vaccine has now been, I think tentatively approved for um, children from five to 11. Um, have we started to, and I know that we have vaccination clinics you mentioned on three days. Um, are they targeting our children as well as the general community as well? Um, or how is that rolling out or not? Great question. So it, it hasn't been approved to start giving out. It's in, it's in conversation right now. However, once we once it is approved, um, we will be working with the city health department to uh, get it out to, to the community and to uh, actually you know, provide the service. So right now, it hasn't been approved for us to provide that for our younger students, but it is approved for 12 years old and up. So that's why we kind of, we target with Kilmer, Rivera and Trenton High because those students are able to uh, get the vaccine. So it's, it's coming, just not here yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, thank, thank, thank you. That's so nice. uh, certainly, um, you know, my comments are, as I've said before, I'm happy to, to be able to um, engage in this particular conversation regarding um, ESSER and uh, how ESSER can help our total community, um, specifically our students, but then our total community because that impacts our students, and so that the uh, uses allows us to be able to, uh, shall we say, have a well-rounded approach to addressing whatever issues that may have been caused by COVID. And certainly, um, you know, we, we we value and we need the the ideas and thoughts of others because one person alone um, cannot think of everything. And so, to get um, various viewpoints and ideas, these opportunities are great opportunities. So. What do they say? Tell a friend if uh, Mr. Earl comes back again, uh, tell a friend, tell a neighbor, come back, share your ideas, complete a proposal. Uh, again, the district is ready and willing to accept whatever um, help that we can get in terms of being able to address this issue, which is a new issue that has never really been faced by us before. So again, um, you know, I wanna say, you know, thank you to everyone who is participating today and also thanks to the community for tuning in. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Lane. Uh, Mr. Refredo Ortiz, uh, Assistant Superintendent of School Support, uh, 30 second commercial and any additional announcements as we close out? Okay, very quickly because we're running out of time, but we are having town hall meetings. Think of Tuesdays. 
every Tuesday, well, not every Tuesday, but starting next week, October 9th, at Dunn Middle School, we're going to have a meeting, uh, a town hall to address the redistricting of the, of the uh, school district, okay? And that will be from 5.30 to 7 p.m. A week later on Tuesday, that will be November 16th from 5.30 to 7, will be a Trent Central High School. A week from that, we'll at 5.30 to 7 o'clock, we will, that's November 23rd, we'll be, we will be at Joyce Kilmer. Uh, and we're inviting all our parents to come in. We're having a, a, a light uh, refreshments for, for you. And we wanna hear from you. We were gonna to explain to you what our redistricting plan looks like. And we need your support. We need you to, to give us your comments so that we, as we move forward, we will be able to present it to the board in, in uh, December. So those are our, my announcements. Well, thank you everyone. We're out of time. Thank you for joining in Trenton Talks and Trenton Bolivar TV radio broadcast. Thank you so much and everyone have a good night. Good night. Thank, thank you everyone. Night.